We continue in our series on the Gospel of Mark, walking through the last days of Jesus' life. And we come to one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible. And so it makes absolutely no sense that I'm going to read the entire chapter and treat it all in one um, morning sermon. Um, And if this is career ending, I'm going to go out with a bang. So um, would you, if you're able, stand with me for the reading of Scripture? Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Listen carefully. These are God's words. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us. When will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains." You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At the time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servant in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is God's word. Let's pray. God, there are mysteries that reside in your all-wise, all-knowing mind, some of which you choose to reveal to us, much of which we simply need to trust will come about in your perfect ways and your perfect timing. We put that, uh, we put Mark 13 in that category and so ask that even in the midst of uncertainty, that you would bring clarity to what we need to know, what you call us to, 
and give us hearts and minds that are watchful and waiting for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Please be seated. We'll start with uh, signs to come. The disciples look back at the temple as they're leaving Jerusalem, crossing the Kindred Valley to the east, and um, walking up the hill to what's known as the Mount of Olives. This is a perspective that uh, you have to understand is just a, a mock-up. Yeah, we need that picture up. Um, it's uh, a model from the Jerusalem Museum. Uh, you can see the little fence <laughs> from which I took the picture. Uh, but this is from the east-southeast looking towards Jerusalem, and y you don't get a sense of the grandeur of the, not only the building, but the entire structure. You don't get a sense of the, the olive trees um, under which the disciples and Jesus would have been sitting or standing with the landscape all around and the entire city with its walls extending to each side. But um, it was a magnificent structure. It was a feat of human engineering, and it took 46 years to build. It was just being finished uh, in Jesus' time. The temple rose 150 feet above its surroundings. That's a 12 to 15-story building. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that some of the foundation stones were 60 feet long, 11 feet high, 8 feet deep, each one weighing over a million pounds. No cranes, no heavy equipment. There was gold, silver, and bronze all over the place. And so the, the entire structure dominating the city of Jerusalem would have gleamed in the sunlight. The disciples would have been in awe of this building, even though they had seen it dozens, if not hundreds of times over the years, going in and out of the city. There was no place where you could enter Jerusalem from this location, and, or any location, and not see the temple. So one disciple comments on the magnificence of the temple, and Jesus responds, not one stone will be left on another. Total destruction of the temple is coming. The disciples want to know, as any inquiring minds would, when will these things happen? Literally, what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Note I underlined the I, uh, repeated phrase. It's one word in the original Greek that will become important in a little bit. When? And let me again point out the obvious. As we start Mark 13, the point of this conversation that leads to everything else Jesus is about to say to his disciples in great detail is the temple and its predicted destruction, which we know from history would happen in 70 AD. Jesus starts answering their questions. Here's what won't be signs that these things are about to happen. Deceivers will come, verse 6, would-be messiahs, don't listen to them. War, earthquakes, and famine will hit, verses 7 and 8. And we know from history, again, uh, multiple examples of each of them would occur in the decades following. But those still would not be signs that these things were about to happen. Not yet, at least. Starting in verse 9, Jesus tells them to be on guard because they'll experience persecution, rejection, and hatred as they proclaim the gospel to all nations. And um, we see that in the book of Acts, glimpsed through the life and ministry of Paul, who encounters opposition at every turn. And historians tell us that first century persecution by the emperor Nero was ruthless, it was brutal, it was horrific. Jesus has a message for the early church, stand firm to the end. So far, not really an answer to when, which is the disciples' question until verse 14, where it starts to get interesting. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. There's this um, parenthetical comment, let the reader understand. It's a point of emphasis. Jesus is urging, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. You need to follow what I'm going to share. It's going to get ugly. And 
Here's a, another hinge point in his teaching. Remember what he had just told his disciples. In the face of persecution, persevere, endure, stand firm to the end, verse 13. Now his attention getting, let the reader understand, pay attention to what I'm about to tell you, takes a very different turn. When you see this, I'll paraphrase, run. Do not go back into your house to get your valuables. Head to the mountains. Don't wait, just get out. In ancient times, if, a, if an army were coming, if something bad were about to come, you would never run to the mountains where wild animals would just get you, where the army would hunt you down uh, eventually. No, uh, in ancient times, you would flee to the nearest fortified city like Jerusalem, which many Jews did. A war broke out with the Romans from 66 to 70 AD. During the siege, there was so much starvation that the Jews resorted to cannibalism. It was a horrific stretch in history. When Jerusalem was finally breached, the abomination that causes desolation was some sort of desecration performed by the pagan armies in what they knew was the most sacred space in all of Israel. The, the holy place of the temple. We don't know what it was. And then the temple and much of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman army. The siege was so horrific, so apocalyptic, that Jesus quoted prophetic language from Isaiah describing the last days in verses 24 to 25. Over one million Jews hiding in the city were slaughtered, but few Christians were killed maybe because they heeded the teaching of Jesus to run. Here's where it gets even more interesting. Secondly, the end of what? Verse 26. I need my glasses. I, I, I staved this off by a, uh, increasing the point size of my notes, but um, there's only a, a limit to how much you can make notes big. Verse 26, at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Surely, we have shifted to the coming back of Jesus at the end of history, right? I don't think so. It's the most controversial thing I'll say all morning. I don't think so. It's a reference to the prophet Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel writes, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. What's Daniel picturing? The son of man, Jesus calls himself the son of man. He's fulfilling Daniel's vision. And this king, over against all other would-be world superpowers, is the true and final king whose kingdom would never end. No other king could claim that. Here's what I think makes the most sense of Daniel of Mark chapter 13. This coming in the clouds of the Son of Man, Jesus, is not the coming back of Jesus at the end of time. It's the coming to the Father, the Ancient of Days, after Jesus' death and resurrection to receive the honor and glory that he deserves as the true and final king of all kings. Why do I say that? A lot of smart people disagree. So let me just share that qualification. I share that because this is a direct reference to Daniel. What does Daniel say happens when the Son of Man comes with the clouds of heaven? He doesn't come to us. He comes to the Father. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. In other words, Jesus is going that way when he comes. And he receives authority and glory and power from the Father. It's a vindication of who Jesus is that he's describing. 
If you assume this coming in clouds is Jesus' return at the end of history, I would suggest you got a bigger problem when you come to verse 30 when he says, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. That generation and many more, 2,000 years later we'd say, have come and gone and Jesus hasn't returned. You got bigger problems, I'd say, if coming with the clouds is Jesus' return at the end of history. So what is Jesus referring to when he says all these things, verse 30, right? This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened Remember that this whole prophetic message is Jesus' detailed answer to the disciples' question regarding the temple being destroyed. Not one stone will be left on another. They say, literally, when will these things happen? What will be the sign that these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus says, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. His focus is on the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70 A.D. That would be within a generation of when Jesus is speaking. Why all of this apocalyptic violence? Why this history-defining moment if it's just the temple being destroyed? Well, don't forget it's Tuesday or Wednesday, and Friday Jesus will be hanging on a cross. We've been talking about this um, compressed period that will take us months to cover because Mark spends so much time covering it, as do the other gospel writers. Opponents of Jesus have lined up to take their shots. They're done now. They, they see what they need to see. They're, they're now scheming to have Jesus arrested and tried and executed. You might say Jesus forced the issue in Mark chapter 11 when he entered the temple courts. He went into Jerusalem, went straight to the temple. He came back the next day, went straight to the temple. Mark 11, he cleared the temple courts. He, he threw furniture. He overturned the money changers' tables. He declared the temple and everything that the religious leaders were standing for to be fruitless religion, as useless as the fig tree with no figs. He reinforced that message with the parable of the tenants. Steve preached that text. The owner of the vineyard will give the vineyard to others because the tenants have rejected the son. And all the religious leaders, Mark 12, 12 tells us, knew that Jesus had spoken the parable against them. I'm giving it to somebody else. This is a battle between truth and falsehood. The the religious leaders representing self-salvation in the name of religion, working to earn God's favor fruitlessly, versus the people of God humbly admitting weakness, inability to solve our greatest problem of sin that leads to death, and trusting solely in God's provided solution, which is the substitute sacrifice of the Son, which is enough, sufficient payment that brings about forgiveness of sin. The temple's destruction will end a way of life for the Jews who had oriented their religious lives around this sacred space for centuries. It was God's plan. It wasn't a bad idea to begin with. It was God's plan. It, it served a, a marvelous purpose. But Jesus says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He was talking about himself. He is the new temple. And sometimes when, uh, sometimes the most merciful thing God could possibly do in your life is to utterly destroy the God substitute that is leading you to engage in false worship, thinking in self-deception that you are honoring God when all you're doing is feeding your pride and your self-righteousness. Sometimes that's the most merciful thing God could possibly do. This wasn't, this wouldn't be, years later, 
just a war with the Romans. This wouldn't be just an important religious building being torn down. This was the difference between false worship and true worship, between idolatry and giving the Lord God the praise that he alone is do. And the timing of this prophecy, Mark 13, is so powerful because in two days' time, Jesus the Messiah would offer himself as the final and perfect sacrifice, doing, accomplishing what the blood of bulls and goats sacrificed at that temple could never accomplish, the forgiveness of sins. It leads us lastly to an action and an attitude. I, I want to clarify what I'm not saying here. I'm not saying that Mark 13 has absolutely nothing to do with the return of Jesus at the end of history. I'm not saying that. Jesus is speaking prophetically here. And in most cases, predictive prophecy in the Old Testament had some measure of immediate fulfillment. In other words, uh, a prophet was saying, this is going to happen, and the people listening to that prophet would have said, oh, it, really? It, it, it meant something to them. It wasn't just this sort of idea that had no bearing. It had immediate fulfillment, at least some measure of it. But all Old Testament prophecy, centuries later, would find greater fulfillment in the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. Why? Because all of the Old Testament, Moses, the Law and the Prophets, Luke 24, is all about Jesus. And so any prediction of God's promises coming to fulfillment have a measure of greater fulfillment in the coming of Jesus in the first century, regardless of when that prophecy came. But today, at least after Mark 13, Jesus having already come in the flesh, we would also say that every promise of God will come to its fullest most consummated fulfillment on the last day when Jesus comes again. And so, it, when he's speaking prophetically, I'm saying that the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem was Jesus' main point, immediate fulfillment, at least within the generation. But as with all other prophecy, the fullest meaning will be revealed on the last day when he returns. And in this particular case, we get a pretty clear glimpse of that because of John's vision of the end of history. And in uh, John, uh, Revelation 21, the new Jerusalem within the new heavens and the new earth has no temple. The new Jerusalem is so very different from the Mark 13 and before Jerusalem with this dominating, um, magnificent structure that spoke to human ingenuity. The new Jerusalem is so very different because that magnificent building is not there. Why? Revelation tells us because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. There's fullest fulfillment. The temple is going to be destroyed. Fruitless religion. The new temple has come. He was talking about 70 AD. But he's also got the end in mind, which is always the case. So what do we do while we wait? Jesus speaks of an action and an attitude. The action is mission, joining the Savior in his work of rescue, of proclaiming this good news of salvation to a lost world. He started it, and his intent is that it continue through the ministry of the church. When Jesus describes what's about to happen, in verse 10 he says, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. In one sense, we would say, well, that still hasn't happened. There are places in the world today where we are pretty sure that the, the name and the gospel of Jesus Christ have not been proclaimed yet. People haven't yet heard. But listen to Paul in Colossians talk about the true message of the gospel that has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. This is first century ministry, and he's using that kind of strong language 
And so in that sense, within a few decades of Jesus speaking in Mark 13, this news about Jesus as Savior would spread throughout the whole world, meaning the entire known world of the Mediterranean, the Roman Empire. Everybody's heard, Paul says. Jesus commands and he assumes that his people, until he comes back, will continue to proclaim a message of salvation through faith in him. That's the action, mission. The attitude is described throughout the entire chapter. Verse 32 points to the wrong attitude when Jesus says that no one knows when, not even the angels, not even the Son, only the Father. Why, why not the Son? Well, Jesus is fully God and fully man, and in his divinity, there are moments when he chooses not to express the, uh, the exercise, the prerogatives of divinity. Divinity means all-knowing omniscient. Jesus the Son chooses not to know. So, prophetic predictions, reading the signs of the times, books and conferences on the end times, Jesus' words pretty much tell us not that important. Instead, what's the attitude? Be on guard. Be alert. Keep watch. The end, for the disciples hearing him, of the temple, um, of world history for all of us uh, who are reading, listening to Jesus today, the end can happen at any point. That doesn't mean we stick our heads in the sand and just wait passively. We don't abandon living and loving, culture-making, enjoying beauty in the arts or in nature certainly not the mission that Jesus calls us to engage in. We shouldn't be obsessed with the end, is my point, but neither should we be in denial about and remain ignorant about the imminence of the end without knowing when. All we need to know is it could happen tomorrow. It could happen on your way home. Be alert. Keep watch. One last thought on the attitude of getting ready in light of judgment on the last day. 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Can I say this? If you have no biblical, godly, right fear of judgment, of, about standing before the one who has made all things, including you, who knows your every thought, who has heard your every word, who has seen your every action. If there is no right, balanced, biblical, godly fear regarding that moment, you're either in denial about the reality of sin and the holiness of God, or as a purely secular person, you would say, when I breathe my last, that's it. Cease to exist. The reality of the end, we firmly believe from Scripture here at Grace Redeemer Church, means that every human being one day will be called to account. If you do have a sense of fear, listen to John again, just before the verse I read. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how we love. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. That godly fear, don't let it overcome you. Don't let it rule you. Don't let it cause you to wallow in self-condemnation or anxiety about the, the, the promise that Jesus is coming and you know not when, John would tell you, grow in the love of God. Chase after intimacy with Jesus. Learn to worship better, more purely as you grow in your understanding of how worthy the King truly is of your love with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then when He comes tomorrow morning, or in the next millennium, there will be no fear, only joy at a reunion like no other. Let's pray. Jesus, 
with John and the early church, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. There's so much that is broken and painful about this world. Guard us from the deception of thinking that relief, escape, moments of fleshly material joy are our hope. They are not. Open our eyes that we might glimpse your return, Jesus. You're making new of all things. You're ushering us into your presence to live in the security and acceptance of your presence only because of your sacrifice, Jesus. Focus us on your glory. Wet our appetites for that day and come. As we wait, use us on mission. Use us to proclaim your goodness, freedom, and forgiveness that you alone provide. Use us mightily as your spirit fills us. We pray for your glory and for our good. Amen.